Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is August 27, 1978, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 37. As the warm, lazy days of August 1978 draw to a close, summer is on the wane for the United States of America. With every passing day now the sun shines less brightly on our land, and already the signs are all around us pointing to a harsh and early winter, but instead of preparing, most of us are still just trying to squeeze the last bit of pleasure out of the little bit of summer that remains. These things are true, my friends, not only in the literal sense of the weather, but also in the figurative historical sense. On all sides we in the United States are playing games with ourselves. We prefer to fool ourselves with comfortable lies than to open our eyes to the brilliant light of the truth, and our secret rulers are quick to assist us in deluding ourselves through every avenue imaginable. So it is, for example, that as the American dollar is dying en route to worldwide monetary chaos, luxurious conferences on the situation are springing up in the United States. More and more people are attending these conferences, expecting to hear what is wrong and what to do, but increasingly they see only the same stale Establishment faces wherever they go, and they hear about everything except the real reasons for our economic woes. So the attendees leave as they came, ignorant of the facts and unable to protect themselves. But the lure of big sounding names in posh accommodations is powerful, and many of the same people show up at one conference after another to be hoodwinked over and over again. The items that fill the alleged news these days are also a study in distraction and distortion. For example, tremendous publicity was focused earlier this month on the American balloonists who successfully crossed the Atlantic for the first time, but hovering over battle stations worldwide are the space-age successors to balloons and dirigibles, the Soviet Cosmospheres. And about these devices, which are a matter of life and death to you, there's a total news blackout. Yesterday a major event took place on the spiritual battleground between East and West. It dominated the news, and yet you were not told what it really meant. I refer to the lightning-fast election of a new Pope who calls himself John Paul I. In recent years many changes have been introduced in Roman Catholic worship. For example, it used to be that every Mass in the free world ended with a prayer for the conversion of Russia, but today as this prayer is being answered in Russia, it is heard no more in the Catholic Mass. In 1954 the Chase Manhattan Bank became the custodian of the enormous business holdings of the Vatican through tax-exempt trust accounts. Since that time the Church has been losing its sovereignty and is today highly politicized. Soon millions of Roman Catholics will be overjoyed to see the Church shifting its policies to an active anti-Russian stance under the guise of anti-Communism, but in reality the Rockefellers want to enlist 700 million Catholics into the war against Russia. As I have explained in my latest two AUDIO LETTERS, the self-styled spiritual Communists who run the Kremlin today regard the atheistic Communism known as Bolshevism as their number one enemy, and now the Pope himself is dominated by Bolshevik influences. But the most crisis-oriented person in the world now is Jimmy Carter. The only hint of this in the news is his disengagement from day-to-day non-crisis situations and his lack of concern over disastrous public opinion polls. Jimmy Carter is a man waiting impatiently for his hour to come, an hour of crisis. He spends large amounts of time away from the White House while medication and other measures are being used to keep him in an artificial, abnormal state of mind. 
because no man in his right mind could do what Jimmy Carter has promised to do for his masters. When the time comes, Jimmy Carter will be called upon to push the button to launch a nuclear first strike against the Soviet Union. The consequences, my friends, will be unthinkable, but in his present artificial euphoria Jimmy Carter can hardly wait to do it. It was only last month that I first made public the American shift to a first strike strategy, but the preparations to carry out this strategy are progressing at a feverish pace. Many pieces of the military jigsaw puzzle are not yet in place, however, and the Soviet Union has already learned the plan through the efforts of their own KGB. The Russians have their own countdown in progress toward the first strike as I explained four months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 33. Meanwhile, they are working fast to thwart the American plan. Regardless of which side succeeds in striking first, the American people and to a lesser extent the entire West will lose. The pathetic Civil Defense Television programs which are being rushed into production now to show just before a nuclear war will do us very little good, my friends. Only if you know the plan will you have any chance to see what is happening in time to protect yourself. There's no timetable, my friends, but we may well have seen our last summer at peace before NUCLEAR WAR ONE. My three topics for today are Topic No. 1, The Middle East Road to an American First Strike. Topic No. 2, Russia's Asian Counter Strategy for a First Strike, and Topic No. 3, The Era of the American Refugee. Topic No. 1. For nearly a year now the Controlled Carter Administration has been in a concealed state of crisis on the road to NUCLEAR WAR ONE. It was 11 months ago to the day, September 27, 1977, that America lost the secret battle of the Harvest Moon in space. Suddenly America's ace in the hole for the coming war, the secret beam weapons based on the moon, was gone. As I revealed in detail that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, the most decisive battle of the 20th century had just taken place. Our secret rulers reacted at first with stark fear and near panic. At first they pretended to capitulate to the Russian Harvest Moon ultimatum for surrender by means of SALT II disarmament. Then as the initial shock wore off, they began stalling tactics to hold off the Russians while they tried to figure out what to do. Meanwhile the Russian Navy swarmed into attack positions around the United States during October 1977. At the same time, the Soviet Union wasted no time in following up on their Harvest Moon space victory. Manned Cosmos Interceptor Killer satellites using charged particle beam weapons began clearing the skies of American spy satellites. Having evicted America from the moon, the Soviet Union also activated a moon flight program to seize the moon for its own particle beam weapons installations of which there are now seven on the near side, and to ruin any chance that the United States might send more men to the moon, our secret orbital way station in the Military Moon Program was destroyed. On October 18, 1977, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 27, Skylab was shot down over the United States by a Cosmos Interceptor Killer satellite, and with it went the five American astronauts who were secretly aboard at the time. Since that time the pace of events has been very fast, as I revealed for you month by month. But the first strike strategy which has now been adopted by the United States first began to surface nine months ago in November 1977. There were three separate developments, and they took place with blinding speed all within a week's time. First there was a so-called Sadat Peace Initiative quote unquote, to Israel. It began on November 14 during television interviews, of all things, in which President Sadat of Egypt and Prime Minister Begin of Israel committed themselves to a face-to-face -face meeting. 
Only a week later Sadat was already returning home from his rush rush trip to Jerusalem, which generated euphoria on all sides. But as I told you then, Sadat's actions were destined to lead to war, not peace, and now the Middle East is approaching the boiling point. Like the Sadat trip to Israel, the second major development also began on November 14. On that day the Shah of Iran arrived in Washington on a rush visit, which ended two days later. No reason was given publicly for his hurry-up trip, but as I told you then, it was linked to the startling events in the Middle East. It was a busy week, my friends, because sandwiched in between the Shah's trip to Washington and Sadat's trip to Israel was the third major event. On November 18 the Voice of America broadcast a threat of preemptive war against Russia, for which I quoted that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 28. That threat was premature, a bluff brought to nothing by the Soviet Navy which swarmed into attack positions again, but it was a taste of things to come. Four months ago in April 1978 Secretary of State Cyrus Vance went to Moscow in response to a renewal of the Harvest Moon Salt Surrender Ultimatum of six months earlier. While there he was provided with crucial information by the Korean Air Ladder Intelligence Mission, which I detailed for you in AUDIO LETTER No. 33. And as soon as he returned to Washington, our secret rulers decided to implement contingency plans for a first-strike nuclear strategy. Since that time the United States and the Soviet Union have been in a race against time, each trying to beat the other into position to launch a decisive surprise attack. In this topic I will outline the American strategy. With that in mind, you will find it much easier to understand the Russian strategy when I outline that in Topic No. 2. The strategic goal in the new American First Strike strategy is to undo the total Russian military domination of space which began 11 months ago. We often hear these days about our so-called triad of strategic weapons meaning ICBMs, missile launching submarines, and bombers. The Russians, of course, possess a similar triad, which in fact is now more powerful than our own. But today the Soviet Union possesses, in addition, a space triad of strategic weapons, and the central objective of the American Surprise Attack Plan is to bring to ruin the Russian space triad. One leg of the Space Triad is the Moon, which bristles with Russian Particle Beam weapons. They can blast almost any spot on Earth within the course of any 24-hour period. Whenever the Moon is above the horizon where you are, you are subject to practically instantaneous attack from the Moon. The second leg of the Soviet Space Triad is the fleet of Cosmos Interceptor Killer Satellites in orbit around the Earth. These Space Age Sentinels are manned and armed with charged Particle Beam weapons with which to blast all non-Soviet military satellites out of existence. Months ago they completed the task of wiping out all of America's early warning and spy satellites, making necessary the Korean Airliner Intelligence Mission of four months ago. Now they remain on patrol ready to nip in the bud any attempt by the United States to re-establish a military toehold in space. The third leg of the Russian Space Triad is the fleet of Cosmospheres, the electrogravitic hovering weapons platforms called the Anti-War Machine by the Kremlin. As I discussed last March in AUDIO LETTER No. 32, the late great General Thomas Power gave a public warning 13 years ago about the coming threat from these platforms, but he was ignored. The United States could have developed these platforms too, but did not, and now the Russians have deployed them over strategic locations worldwide and in great numbers. Armed with charged Particle Beam weapons, they can produce weather modification effects by means of defocused blasts into the upper atmosphere. In the process they also generate violent air blasts which were heard last winter over the United States but they can also focus their Particle Beams in order to vaporize targets on the ground at sea or in the air. 
so long as the Russian space triad remains intact, the West has no hope of victory or even a draw in a war with the Soviet Union. But our secret rulers cannot shake their dream of world domination, so instead of taking measures that could prevent war, they are trying to position themselves to smash the Russian space triad. Even if they succeed, a furious and massive Russian counterattack is a certainty, and our secret rulers know it. But they believe there is a chance that the conflict will finally sputter out into a stalemate if the Russian space triad can be neutralized. And beginning from the smoking ruins of this stalemate, they think they will be able to start over again about as well off as the Soviet Union. The price of achieving this desired stalemate has already been studied with the aid of think tank computers. If the American first strike turns out to be a spectacular success, there could be 255 million fatalities in the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain, plus a few million in selected other target areas. But even in this best case, however, more than half the casualties will take place in the United States which, unlike Russia, is naked in terms of civil defense. If things do not go so well, though, the computers say that up to 350 million people may die before the stalemate point is reached. The United States has no effective means by which to attack the Soviet space triad directly, but there is one weak point which is shared by all three legs of the Russian space triad, and that weak point is logistics. The cosmonauts who man the Particle Beam bases on the Moon depend for their lives on regular supply missions from Earth. Likewise, the Cosmos interceptors in Earth orbit can remain operational only so long as their crews can be rotated and resupplied from Earth and the Cosmospheres too require periodic servicing and resupply in order to keep operating. The centerpiece of the American First Strike, my friends, is to be a knockout punch at Russia's Space Logistics Network. The plan is to destroy all four Soviet Cosmodromes, plus the Cosmosphere installations in Central Siberia in a fast, well-coordinated blow. Immediately following this initial blow, there is to follow a full-scale nuclear attack by the American triad of ICBMs, Poseidon missiles, and bombers. The key weapon to be used in the attack on Russia's space bases is a secret weapon which until now has never assumed great importance. For a change, it is a weapon which the United States did develop while Russia did not. It is a strange hybrid machine called a Submersible Aircraft, or Subcraft for short. A Subcraft is an airplane which can land on water, change its configuration, dive and travel underwater like a submarine. Then near its destination it can reverse the process and seem to come from nowhere as it attacks the target from the air. Subcraft development began in the United States in the early 1960s. Those available today do not dive very deep, and they are not very fast either underwater or in the air. Their strength lies in their ability to sneak past enemy defenses. Submerged, they have surprisingly long endurance and range due to a small nuclear power plant derived from space technology. They can travel through shallow coastal waters where sonar detection is all but impossible, and their relatively small size and quiet operation also help reduce the chances of detection. In the air they duck under radar by flying at treetop height, and they are so quiet that they attract little or no attention en route to the target. The critical role of subcraft in the American First Strike Plan is the result of geography. They are not involved in the part of the attack plan directed at the Cosmosphere bases in Central Siberia, but they are the key ingredient in the planned attack on Russia's four Cosmodromes. The real estate of three countries is critical to the First Strike Plan. The countries are Norway, Iran, and China. 
Staging areas in all three must be used if the first strike plan is to succeed in knocking out the Russian Space Triad. From the fjords of northern Norway American subcraft are to head eastward under water, straight into the jaws of the Russian Bear. They will have to make their way past Murmansk, which teams with Russian submarines. Continuing onward, they will follow the shoreline of the Kola Peninsula around and into the White Sea. Then they are to penetrate southwest into the White Sea to the vicinity of Onega before surfacing at night. From there it is a short flight of little more than 100 miles to their target, the Placetsk Cosmodrome. If the plan works, night will be turned to day, as the Cosmodrome is consumed by nuclear fireballs. For the other three Cosmodrome attacks, Iran is to provide the staging areas along the south end of the Caspian Sea. Two subcraft contingents are to travel submerged roughly half the length of the Caspian, then fly east across the Oost-Ert Plateau to the Aral Sea. There they are to submerge again and proceed to the northeast side until it is time to attack. The third subcraft contingent from Iran is to travel northward the entire length of the Caspian and then lie in wait for the moment of attack. In the attack itself, the subcraft squadron in the north end of the Caspian will surface at night. Heading northwest, they will fly roughly 250 miles to attack the Kapustin Yar Cosmodrome east of Stalingrad. Meanwhile, subcraft will surface in the Aral Sea and fly northeast. The first group will head for the original Baikonur Cosmodrome some 250 to 300 miles away. Shortly afterward, the other group will take off to attack the Tuyuratan Cosmodrome, barely 100 miles distant. If all goes according to plan, the Cosmodromes at Kapustin Yar, Baikonur, and Tuyuratan will erupt into nighttime nuclear fireballs at the same time as the Placets Cosmodrome far to the north meets the same fate. In this manner, the subcraft attacks from Norway and Iran are intended to cripple two of the three legs of the Russian Space Triad, the Moon and the orbiting Cosmos Interceptors. That leaves only the Cosmospheres. The Cosmosphere bases are located in central Siberia, far from any body of water that would be useful to submersible aircraft. First there is Semipalatinsk, where both underground nuclear tests and particle beam weapon tests are carried out. At Semipalatinsk the Cosmospheres are assembled and outfitted with their nuclear power plants and particle beam weapons. Then they are transferred 400 miles northeast to the Novosibirsk Science City, where the operational Cosmosphere base is located. The key to the American attack plan for the two Cosmosphere installations is northern Xinjiang Province, China. From there to Novosibirsk, the primary target, it is only 400 miles and the secondary target, Semipalatinsk, is less than 300 miles distant. The Rockefellers are trying to move heaven and earth to persuade China to open up Xinjiang Province to a secret American attack force. The attack from Xinjiang Province is to be built around very high-speed, remotely piloted airplanes called RPVs, which have been under development for years in both Russia and America. Since the pilot stays behind on the ground and guides the plane by remote control, a RPV is much smaller than an equivalent piloted airplane. It can also perform evasive maneuvers so violent that the pilot would be crushed if he were aboard. Our secret rulers believe that enough of these aircraft can penetrate Russian defenses to ensure destruction of the Siberian Cosmosphere installations. My friends, I have now told you about the strategic objectives and techniques which are being planned for the American first strike against Russia, but you must know about one additional key to this suicidal plan. I refer to the Middle East crisis now building up, which is intended to light the fuse for NUCLEAR WAR ONE. A few days from now the Camp David summit between Sadat of Egypt and Begin of Israel is to get underway. Our secret rulers are trying to ensure that a new Begin will emerge from these meetings to delight the public. Suddenly the hardline attitudes of recent days will seem to evaporate on both sides, much to everyone's surprise. 
conciliation and mutual concessions will become the order of the day, and the joyful shouts of Peace! Peace! will ring in our ears. The euphoria surrounding the outcome of the Camp David Summit will be like an echo of the high hopes of last November 1977, just after Sadat's trip to Jerusalem. As a result, most of us will pay little attention to the foundation on which all else will rest. Underlying all the smiles and happy words, there is to be an agreement by which American troops will be sent to the Middle East as supposed guarantors of the peace. It will all be made to appear logical and honest, and no one will dare to raise a finger to criticize this plan. But now let me tell you what is really planned, for only if you know the truth will you have any chance to protect yourself in the disastrous days that lie ahead. The arrangements agreed to at the Camp David Summit are to set the military stage for a horrendous incident to provoke war in the Middle East. The overall plan is an update of the one I described nearly three years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 6 for November 1975. Here now is the full outline of the new American strategy for preemptive nuclear war against Russia. This terrible war plan, my friends, has nothing to do with preservation of our so-called national security. It is a last-ditch Rockefeller blueprint for national suicide. First the Camp David Summit is to set the stage for Middle East war, while seeming to do the opposite. Then as soon as the Special American Forces are in position for their strikes against the Russian Space Triad, a major incident will poison the Middle East peace atmosphere overnight. One option involves the Sinai, but other options are also being prepared. But regardless of the details of the incident, it will be staged in such a way that the finger of guilt will point toward Saudi Arabia. Tensions will build fast and with them American public opinion against Saudi Arabia. Meanwhile the Rockefeller propaganda machine will excite fears that somehow the Soviet Union is preparing to move full blast in the Middle East. There will be additional incidents and clashes, and the very existence of Israel will appear to be at stake. At the same time, Americans will be reminded of the key role of Israel as a military ally in the Middle East. American public opinion will be inflamed with fear for Israel, anger at Saudi Arabia, and a desire to get tough with Russia, and then it will happen. In the world's first limited nuclear strike, Saudi Arabia will be brought to her knees at a single blow. The wellheads of Saudi Arabia's mammoth oil fields will vanish in nuclear fireballs. Desert sand will fuse into radioactive glass, capping off the oil wells. Radioactivity will prevent reopening the wells for at least 10 years, according to CIA estimates. The world will be badly shaken by witnessing this first use of tactical nuclear weapons but the Rockefeller propaganda machine will paint it in the best possible light, drawing upon the carefully constructed image of Saudi Arabia as a threat to Israel's existence. It will even be said that the short, decisive attack on the oil fields was a relatively humane act, having spared Saudi population centers. In this way nuclear warfare will begin to be domesticated in our minds and unthinkable no longer. The cutoff of Saudi Arabian oil will trigger gas rationing in the United States and severe dislocations in Europe and Japan. This will provide an excuse for Jimmy Carter to declare a national emergency as the United States secretly prepares to go to war. Jimmy Carter's energy crisis, that is, the moral equivalent of war, will be manipulated into reality. Across the Persian Gulf from Saudi Arabia, Iran will react to the oil field raid by going on a full-scale nationwide alert. The Shah will point to the serious rioting of late, which has an anti-Western flavor. 
He will point to ominous behavior by the Soviet Union, and he will raise the specter of a Russian attack on Iran like the American-Israeli attack on Saudi Arabia. With Saudi Arabia gone, Iran will be America's largest remaining source of Middle East oil. With gas rationing already underway by then, Americans will find the Shah's warnings very frightening. The Shah will publicly remind Washington of the, quote, total United States commitment to come to Iran's aid in an emergency, unquote which was announced last November 16, 1977. The American public will demand that it is time for the United States to stand up to Russia, and with full public support American troops and weapons will pour into Iran. From that point onward the outbreak of NUCLEAR WAR ONE will be all but impossible for the public to follow by way of the so-called news. Incidents and clashes will condition the American public to the increasingly aggressive behavior of Russia. We will hear more and more about civil defense, especially about plans to evacuate our cities in the event of war, but when it happens, all who have trusted the United States Government and the major media will be caught completely by surprise. It will begin, according to the American First Strike strategy, with the surprise attacks against the Russian Space Triad. The attacks against the four Cosmodromes and the two Cosmosphere installations are to be timed so that they all occur simultaneously. Then the all-out American nuclear follow-up attack will be launched. Special preparations are underway now to make this follow-up attack on Russia more effective and to evade the Soviet defense system as much as possible. For example, America's fleet of giant Titan II ICBMs are being modified for fractional orbital bombardment by Martin Marietta, the Titan's manufacturer. This work is being financed through a number of secret avenues. One example is the $32 million contract from NASA to build a rescue rocket for Skylab, which of course no longer exists. Only three days ago a freshly modified Titan II near Rock, Kansas attracted nationwide attention due to an accident that occurred just after it was reinstalled in its silo. When it was being reloaded with propellants, a leak sent poisonous reddish fumes towering into the sky. Another factor in the follow-up American nuclear attack is to be high-power laser weapons in two ways. The first way has to do with our ICBMs. Floating over all American ICBM installations today are Soviet Cosmospheres. They are there in order to blast our ICBMs at the moment of launch using their charged particle beam weapons but one of the secret American weapons programs to which I have referred in recent months is the LASER program. Some time ago LASER scientists solved a major technical problem in high-power LASER weapons. Called thermal blooming, this problem made lasers relatively ineffective when fired within the atmosphere, but now high-power lasers are being deployed near our major ICBM bases. Just before the missiles are launched, these lasers will be used, if possible, to shoot down the threatening Cosmospheres. Then the missiles will be launched at Russia. The other role of lasers in the coming war is to involve the Moon. Our secret rulers know very well that the destruction of Russia's Cosmodromes will trigger a furious counterattack and in particular the Lunar Particle Beam bases are certain to start blasting American targets on Earth in an all-out attack. In order to at least reduce the damage which the Moon will be able to inflict, several extremely high-power lasers are now deployed on CIA-controlled ships at sea. Their job is to fire at the seven Russian bases on the near side of the Moon, knocking out or damaging as many as possible. Thus. A beam weapons battle is shaping up for the early moments of NUCLEAR WAR ONE between the Earth and the Moon. It will be the Earth-bound mobile lasers of the United States pitted against the charged particle beam weapons of Soviet Russia on the Moon. The American lasers are no match for the Russian particle beams, but our secret rulers view this as a way to cut their losses.
Even if only part of the moon bases are silenced by lasers, they will reduce the damage that can be inflicted by the others while their supplies are running out. When the American first strike takes place, these are the things that are planned. But for those of us sitting at home when the air raid sirens begin to blare, none of this will be apparent. All we will know is that suddenly the unthinkable is happening. We are under nuclear attack. At the same time, Russians will be experiencing the same thing, but with one major difference. They have been provided with a network of civil defense blast shelters that will save many of their lives. You and I have not. Topic No. 2 the American First Strike Plan is a last-ditch attempt by our secret rulers to snatch not victory but mere stalemate from the jaws of defeat. Even at that, the plan will fail if any part of the Russian space triad survives intact, and our secret rulers are closing their eyes to fatal flaws in the entire strategy. These flaws are so major that the Kremlin now plans to permit early parts of the plan to be carried out, because in this way our secret rulers will give Russia the perfect excuse for her own crushing first strike against America. In AUDIO LETTER No. 33 four months ago, I revealed that the Kremlin is clearing the decks to go to war. In this the Russians want to get several major matters taken care of before NUCLEAR WAR ONE so that America can be smashed at minimum cost to Russia. The Politburo committed Russia to a definite countdown toward war on April 22, 1978, as I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 33. The major objectives in this countdown are still as I told you then, and progress is being made rapidly on them all. First is the matter of conditioning the Russian people for war. This task has already been carried a long way. The Pravda warning, which I quoted last month about the cliffs of confrontation, is but one example. The second major objective is for the completion of the invasion preparations in Canada and Mexico. I first described these to you five months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 32. Earlier this summer in June the process was speeded up in Canada after Canada expelled all United States fishing vessels from her waters, and in Mexico Russian troops and equipment, including tanks and neutron bombs, are being funneled in through the Yucatan Peninsula. The third major objective in the Russian war countdown has to do with Red China. Before war comes with America, Russia must neutralize China as a threat one way or another, and now that China is intended by the Rockefellers to play a role in the American First Strike Plan, China has become a top priority item on the Kremlin agenda. In connection with the American First Strike Plan, which has been known within the Kremlin since early June, Russia has also singled out Norway and Iran for special attention. Since June 29, Russian intelligence ships of various types have been repeatedly stopping in Norwegian territorial waters off northern Norway. They are scouting out the staging area from which American subcraft will be launched to attack the Placets Cosmodrome, and in Iran anti-Western rioting is now seriously threatening the Shah's control over the country. Should he be toppled from power in an anti-Western coup or revolt, Iran will be lost as an asset in the American First Strike Plan. The door to attack on three of Russia's four Cosmodromes would be closed. But Iran and Norway are small potatoes compared to China. For the short term, Russia wants to protect her Cosmosphere installations by denying American access to China's crucial Xinjiang Province, but more than that, the new Asian Axis is in gestation, about which I warned five years ago in my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar. Earlier this month, on August 12, 1978, Japan and China did sign the Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation, about which I reminded you last month, and Japan did succeed in obtaining the Auxiliary Clause I described last month. It states in effect that the treaty is not directed against Russia. 
Japan is becoming the pivot of the new Asian axis, but the focus is now on China. Right now Russia is holding out both the carrot and the stick to China. The carrot is the promise that if China will align herself with Russia, China will share in the fruits of Russia's still growing power. The stick is the threat that if China does not abandon her anti-Russian politics, she will be in deep, deep trouble militarily. To drive home this point, Soviet encirclement of China with Soviet client states is continuing. Recently, for example, Vietnam has been increasingly belligerent toward Red China, and even border fighting has taken place in the past several days, and Laos and Afghanistan are both receiving huge stores of arms from Russia. Verbal abuse between Moscow and Peking is going on as usual right now, but Chairman Hua's unprecedented trip this month from China to Romania and Yugoslavia tells the real story. It all began last May when Premier Ceausescu of Romania went to China and received a tumultuous welcome there. Ceausescu, my friends, has been portrayed in news reports in America as a sort of fence-setter in the Soviet orbit but that's not correct. He is Russia's ace go-between in sensitive dealings with other countries. In Peking last May, Ceausescu conveyed Russian overtures for a reconciliation to Chairman Hua. This led to Hua's follow-up trip this month to Romania plus Yugoslavia and Iran. Last month on July 13, China sent a clear signal to the Kremlin indicated interest in Russia's overtures. On that date China severed her long-standing ties with Albania, which is strongly anti-Russian. Scarcely a month later, on August 16, Hua arrived in Bucharest, Romania, a Russian satellite. Meanwhile Ceausescu had visited Leonid Brezhnev No. 2 in the Crimea in order to find out what to say to Hua. While Hua was in Romania, he was greeted warmly by the Russian Ambassador to Romania at a reception, contrary to news reports in the United States, and Romania agreed to give China a consulate on the Black Sea. From there the Chinese will be able to observe movements of Russia's Black Sea naval fleet. This is intended as a gesture of good faith by Russia to China. When Hua left Romania, he went next to Yugoslavia. The reason for his visit reflects the increasingly similar thinking about some things by the Russian and Chinese ruling circles. I mentioned last month that those who run Russia today have accepted the verdict that socialism is not workable and that already collectivized agriculture is being phased out. Hua's interest in Yugoslavia in a parallel vein was to study the Yugoslav factory worker self-management system free from political Central Committee controls. My friends, the tug of war between Russia and the United States over China is intensifying, but with every passing day it becomes more certain that Russia will win in this contest. The truth has to be faced. Once Russia and China are teamed up once again, the new Asian axis will spring into being almost overnight, because Japan, the third leg of the axis, has already been striving for good relations with both of the other powers. The new Asian axis will be cemented by more than racial ties and economic benefits. They all share a unifying drive for revenge against the United States and the West for untold suffering on their part during the past 80 years, they intend to repay us double. With China in hand, Russia will be ready to set her own first strike plan in motion. First, she will allow our secret rulers to begin the war sequence, whether in the Middle East or elsewhere. In this way the Kremlin will be able to rally the Russian people completely for war. Meanwhile, if the Russian overtures to China now underway are successful, Chinese troops will join the primarily Asian Soviet invasion forces in Canada and Mexico. Without the Asian expertise of their late brother John D. III, the three remaining Rockefeller brothers will discover too late that they have lost China to Russia. Without China, 
the Cosmosphere leg of the Russian Space Triad will be safe from the American first strike, and the plan will fail. In the end, even the attack on the Cosmodromes will be partially thwarted, but our secret rulers will go ahead with this final kamikaze plan. But even before the Middle East erupts, the Kremlin plans to start increasing the pressure on America by means of geophysical warfare, including both weather manipulation and artificial earthquakes. Right now, America's weather is being tortured by our own secret rulers. They are using the coastal weather control grids I told you about three months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 34. This is being done in order to create deliberate food shortages to help in controlling you and me through the old Bolshevik weapon of hunger. It is also being done in order to ruin thousands of American farmers. In this way their land can be grabbed up in the corporate collectivizing of agriculture now underway here in the United States. At this very moment, in fact, the Rockefeller weather control grids are being used in an attempt to bring on widespread killer weather patterns. If they succeed, great masses of corn, soybeans, and certain feed grains will be wiped out. But the Russian weather modification by means of their Cosmospheres planned for this winter will not be economic but military in its objectives. As for the artificial earthquakes, that has already begun. In AUDIO LETTER No. 24 from May 1977, I gave the locations of seven Russian super bombs planted deep in the ocean trenches around the Philippines. Since then I have also made public the Russian program of planting and detonating powerful cobalt bombs under sea around the Pacific Rim. These have produced numerous earthquakes, increasing the stresses in the earth around the Philippines. When the stresses are high enough, the super bombs will be set off to devastate the Philippines and shake the whole Pacific Rim, the Ring of Fire. Those stresses are nearing the critical point now. Three months ago the long, silent Mayon volcano in the Philippines began erupting, and late last month the nearby Bulosan volcano began a spectacular eruption after a silence of 56 years. As I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 24, the earthquake catastrophe to come in the Philippines is intended also to devastate America's west coast, and the Russians are leaving nothing to chance. At least nine cobalt bombs with varying yields have now been planted in the vicinity of the San Andreas Fault. They stretch from the north end of the Gulf of California to a point about 40 miles west of Point Delgada in Northern California. Several of these are inland, one in the Salton Sea northeast of San Diego, one in abandoned mine shaft three miles southeast of Palmdale, and one in the San Luis Reservoir southeast of San Jose. There is also a very powerful cobalt bomb now in San Pablo Bay, northeast of San Francisco. Should it be set off in such shallow waters, the entire area will be blanketed by deadly radiation for a generation. Two weeks ago today, on August 13, one of the other bombs was set off. It was in the ocean 7.5 miles south of Santa Barbara. Some people heard what they described as a powerful explosion followed shortly after by the earthquake itself, and one eyewitness in the mountains who happened to be looking in that direction described what he saw, quote, There was a great huge spout of water. It rose up and then fell back. The quake came right after that." Unquote. The next day the National Security Council held a crisis meeting. The decision was made to play down the Santa Barbara incident because America is not yet ready to go to war. Topic No. 3. My friends, for 200 years and more the shores of America have promised haven to refugees from all over the world, but now the United States has thrown away her unique heritage. The American dream is ending in a nightmare, and for the very first time ever the era of the American refugee is dawning. We will be refugees from economic oppression, from hunger, from war, and from Bolshevik revolution. 
For 80 years, beginning at the time of the Spanish-American War, the United States has been selling her soul step by step. Our secret rulers have caused needless suffering, tragedy, and death on a scale that has no precedent in all of human history, and yet, with only scattered exceptions, we the American people have blinded ourselves and accepted all that has happened. In this way we have made ourselves party to the satanic actions of the Rockefeller Cartel, and we will surely pay the price. Today. Everyone is wondering why the dollar is dying. American tourists overseas are finding that the so-called almighty dollar is becoming a powerless midget. When interviewed by television reporters, they say things like, quote, Is there something going on in the States that I don't know about? Unquote. Five years ago, when something could still have been done about it, my book The Conspiracy Against the Dollar was published. It told in detail what was coming, why, and who was responsible. But five years ago no one was hurting yet, so the American people relaxed and did nothing. Today everyone can see it happening, but now it's too late to save our economy. So now American economic refugees are beginning to do the only thing they can do for themselves and their families. They are fleeing from the dollar and even from America itself. By the same token, the advanced information I have made public about hunger due to weather control and about the coming Bolshevik Revolution is generally being ignored now. People are not hurting yet, so why think about such things? But when it happens, those who succeed in escaping will be among history's most pathetic refugees. But worst of all, Nuclear War I is looming. Here too the chances for preventing disaster have been forfeited. Therefore, my friends, my advice to all who will listen is to make serious preparations to leave the United States, if you can possibly do so. And before you say, I can't do that, please think very hard. On the day that nuclear fireballs and Asian armies sweep across our land, Will you suddenly realize that you could have left if you only had tried? Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.